So we've got our distinguished panel here. We're going to tap into the minds, the collective minds of, of these fine gentlemen to talk a little bit about the three C's that I mentioned earlier today. We talked about consumerization. We talked about cloud slash virtualization. And Aaron certainly uh, mentioned the software defined data center and networking that uh, is so valuable with a virtualization initiative. And then we certainly heard a great deal about cyber threats and advanced persistent threats and targeted attacks from this morning's session. We're going to dive back in with some specific questions. Uh, I've got a couple of questions prepared. We've got some from the audience. And then if we get anybody uh, chiming on, in on Twitter, we'll go ahead and try to direct, grab one of those questions as well. So what I'd like to do first is ask, uh, really, uh, I'm going to throw this to uh, Andrew from an analyst perspective. Um, there's no doubt impact uh, to an organization with a cyber event that uh, has, it could be a crippling uh, from a reputation standpoint, a monetary standpoint, to a public institution or a for-profit institution. What are you seeing when you're going out and doing your research is the biggest driver when organizations are starting to look at investing in security? What are some of the key triggers that they look to uh, focus on from a business perspective to mitigate any kind of risk and then the fallout from that? And then how does that affect their decision-making process? It's a very long and complex question. I could give you a very long answer, but I'll just, I'll just try and cut to the chase and really get to the point. I think that you know most organizations uh, are not thinking about security at the outset of discussions around moving to, to cloud uh, and using mobile devices. Uh, it seems to be more of a reactive approach. They tend to decide to roll out a type of new technology and then the security follows. Or alternatively, there's the other type, and you see there's more in Asia than Australia, uh, where the company kind of just paralyzes itself, the organization paralyzes itself with concern about security, and it holds it back from a lot of the new initiatives. So I think to the point that, uh, that Andrew brought up, I think some of the more progressive organizations that we speak to, and it sounds like NAB is one of them, are starting to view security as an enabler for uh, you know, these new initiatives that the organization needs to bring new services to market, uh, to be more agile, and often they involve using mobile technology and cloud technology, these new initiatives. So in summary, we're not seeing you know, organizations perhaps take security, uh, uh, you know, put as much priority as they should be around these new initiatives as a whole. Um, and some of the more progressive ones uh, obviously are, but they're, they're getting into the discussion early and positioning the security professionals as enablers. Excellent. Mr. Dell, quick question for you. I think in particular the thing that resonated with me in your talk was the business going around IT. I thought that was uh, very interesting and, and want to touch on that a little bit more. We often hear around the concept of shadow IT and I think that's a perfect example of people going around the business to try to get things done. Can we revisit some of the elements that you talked about and, and ultimately what are you seeing is a compromise for you know speed, security, agility, so we don't have that circumvention of the business going around and creating shadow IT capabilities. What what's the balance there? Yeah, sure. And I guess from the outset, the business can go around; it hasn't. All right. So <laughs> to to be clear, it hasn't been a problem for us, but it could very quickly eventualize, eventuate in, in in those types of uh, scenarios. Um, in, ter in terms of the compromise, we, we, need to, we, need to, we need to come to the table with some flexible, and agile, and, re and, 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 and maybe not gold-plated solutions. I think that's, that's the problem we come, we, we come to the table traditionally with, well, these are the controls we offer in, on, in, inside our environment, and you need to have exactly the same controls to the same level. Uh, we, need to, we need to find a hybrid model whereby we look at the holistic threats and those, the, what, what, are the key, what are the key exposures and what components do we need and how do we manage them best. Um, but, but there are, there, NAB have taken a very strategic approach not to outsource security. So we need, to, we need to also overlay on that the ability for us to have visibility of whatever the solution is. So it might be a hybrid solution for something that's outside the bank whereby there's, an, there's another product square set or another provider who assists us with that security. But it's important from us from a governance and an ownership perspective because as I said we can't outsource that accountability to have the visibility of that. And, and even feeds into our surveillance platform so that we're, we, we are able to act, act as another level of control on top of whatever we've provided for the business application. Excellent. I think that makes a lot of sense. Appreciate that answer. Yo, Ryman, I'll send it over to you. You know, certainly you, you boil it down to it's less about cloud, it's more 
X as a service, you know, in particular would seem to see a lot of cloud adoption in the form of infrastructure as a service right now. Kind of along the lines of what Andrew just mentioned, how are you seeing organizations move towards the adoption of those service provider type organizations or X as a service? How are they managing that and how are they feeling comfortable that they can actually take that journey and still involve their best practices than which they've done inside their own four walls? How are you seeing that out there take place? Uh, do they feel comfortable? They are doing it. Uh, again, you mentioned about Shadow ID. And if the IT department doesn't do it, somebody will find a way to do it. So let's talk about Amazon Web Services, which is heavily used as Shadow IT. Nobody knows about it. Let's talk about virtualization. It's just that easy to set up a virtual machine. That's why it's so great to work with VMware, because once you use agentless technology, you protect the hypervisor, and no matter how many machines pop up underneath, they're all protected. So I think what's going on, uh, it's happening. You can't avoid it. Virtualization is everywhere. I see it within Trend Micro. I see it within every organization. And uh, companies sometimes are really concerned moving to cloud, moving to virtualized environment. But I sometimes ask myself, is it safer to do this? Let's think about it. A lot of the threats we discussed today are existing because we relied on a monoculture based on Microsoft. So it was easy for the attacker. The moment we move to virtualization and the moment we manage it well, we talk about multi-platform. How many data centers are just running Microsoft? How many data centers are running Red Hat? Are running other operating work? It's the same with mobile. You have all kind of different OS, and as long as you manage them well, as long as you patch them well, it's the same with your cloud infrastructure. I actually believe you could increase security because you don't have a monoculture anymore, and you don't have one uh, weak point where you could shut down the organization. Excellent. Agreed. Aaron, I want to follow up a little bit. You certainly, Ryman, touched on our relationship uh, that, that we have with, uh, with VMware and, and integrating security into the platform. From a, from a skill set perspective, you know, I think it often gets lost um, that we can just adopt virtualization or adopt cloud-based technologies and not have an understanding of how that impacts the current IT workforce. From your experience you know, in product management and as you're deploying features, what are you hearing from People like people in this room around the features and functionality they need to be successful in a platform and ultimately roll that into what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. What are you hearing as far as IT skill sets and adoption? So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. So most security players, practitioners today, they're sort of in the market and they're having a look around it. Uh, a number of different tool sets to address a number of different point solutions. Uh, and we see that from a lot of niche vendors there. They might be very good at one particular thing. But the challenge you've got from that one is actually a ramp in skill within that team to be able to use those tools. Um, the overarching theme is that we're seeing that as new problems are discovered, new niche vendors, and of course I'm encouraging the full adoption of startups in this fine, uh, fine country of ours, uh, but you do tend to find that it's a, it's a tool per purpose. And when you have to be, when you're an enterprise, whether you're a large organization, and you have to try and holistically address uh, a security standpoint from not just an infrastructure perspective, but also from the people and process perspective, you tend to find that the integration between a lot of those tools is proving to be the biggest challenge. So the challenge isn't just skilling up on the new tool from a people perspective, it's also how you're getting the right level of information from those respective tools as well. The other challenge you also see, and on that part, often you'll see tools that are contradictory in the information that they provide. So you have to become almost a broker of, uh, of information yourself as to what you look at and what you don't. Um, the third thing is that how difficult it is to actually deploy these technologies and where they integrate well. Um, the VMware approach is obviously, uh, obviously uh, they oriented around a virtual appliance uh, standpoint. So we have an industry standard that we use. It's packaged up into something called an open virtualization appliance format. And you, know, you go into vCenter and you say, install this appliance. You tell it where it is, you tell it what it would like to have, and it deploys the appliance. You then go into that appliance and you configure it. 
these things, relatively speaking, despite the sheer volume of tweaking and tuning you can do, are actually quite straightforward. And the time to value is, is quite a bit uh, enhanced as to what it is for a lot of the other solutions out there. Uh, it's also an interesting point when you have a look at, uh, and to your point earlier, around having multiple platforms. Um, it's actually been proven that the cost element involved with managing multiple platforms tends to go higher. Uh, it's not just a cost from a dollars or capex perspective, it's also a cost from an opex perspective as well, because you're having to actually manage twice as many consoles, twice as many tool sets across you know, disparate infrastructures. So looking at the players that have those portfolios that can actually abridge not just across a virtualized layer, but also up into the operating system and the application stack uh, is where a lot of these efficiencies can actually be gained. And of course, our integration with Trend Micro, I mean, like the, the out of the box functionality you get from there and the instant on value from that introspective uh, example that I used earlier, uh, that is worlds apart a far better way of doing things than having something that's traditionally agent based. Thank you. Can I, if I can just add to that, then, then both of the conversations we just had, had there around the cloud and how we might secure that is a great example of how we might have to compromise. Do I, want to, do I want to spin my own infrastructure up in the environment and have all the management overhead and oversight that's required with that? Or do I want to work with someone who's already integrated and tightened a couple? And I understand the risk posture and those controls. But importantly, I have some requirements. Can I, can I see the information in my own environment? Can I control? Can I do some configuration at my side? And if that's usable and functional, then that's a hell of a lot more attractive to me than having to spin up my own infrastructure. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a great point. I'm going to throw another acronym at everybody that speaks to that point. So a, a lot of times with regard to moving services to a private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud, we often talk about the concept of BYOC. That's bring your own compliance or bring your own controls, right? Because that's what we're all going to want to feel comfortable with. So there's another BYO blah, BYOC, bring your own controls, bring your own compliance. So Sanjay, I have not forgotten about you. One of the things that I would like to touch on with you, uh, with your responsibilities within the region, is you talk to a lot of different executives, IT decision makers, business leaders. What are you hearing from them when you go out and, and talk about you know, security and ultimately their assets? What are you hearing from them that is keeping them up at night when it comes to security and, and their overall business? I don't think much has changed. I mean, it basically still comes down to budget, resource, and, and everything else. But um, I had a discussion just over the break that when you look at advanced cyber threats, or advanced targeted attacks, one of the things organizations are now wrestling with is, I don't have the teams in place who understand security attacks at this level. What do I do? Who do I turn to? Right? So even if I implement great products, what partners do I need to bring to that equation to do something? This is actually an area where maybe cloud helps. Right? You can't do it right in your environment, not because of technology or because of budget, because you don't actually have skills. Um, so that, I think, is changing the landscape uh, actually uh, fairly dramatically. Um, the other things that are starting to creep into Australia that haven't historically, I think, when I, I first moved to the region a year ago, um, <coughs> the year prior to that, uh, when I was kind of sizing up the, the move to ANZ, PCI didn't exist, really. I mean, people would mention it, but it, it's month after month starting to get more and more teeth. Now you're seeing data breach notification laws coming in, right? So regulatory controls and, and compliance that haven't been in place in ANZ are now starting to really take hold. Um, and then on top of all of that, one of the things I think folks aren't thinking of is how am I going to respond, right? You, you heard from Ryman today, the CTO of you know, one of the biggest security vendors on the planet, that it's only a question of when, right? And that, by the way, is for us and for everybody in the room. It is only a question of when. If somebody wants to get you, they're going to get you. What I don't see people doing is thinking about how they're going to handle it in the press, with their shareholders, with their stock price, and things like that. So I, I would encourage all of you to not only think about, I'm going to move my data to the cloud, I'm going to adopt a BOIOD policy. If you go to the cloud, what happens when that relationship ends up in divorce? What are you going to do? How are you going to get your data back? When you bring in and allow BYOD and somebody does the wrong thing, how are you going to respond? And when the unfortunate day comes when your name is on the front of the Australian, what the hell are you going to do? That's, that's great insight. And I think really what that speaks to having a formal incident response plan. And I think that's a core backbone for all the uh, information security practitioners out there. You know that that is a key aspect of what you need to put in place for your information security management program. So I want to do one last question, it's, and it's around skill sets. I think it's um, uh, interesting and, and a nice segue into uh, 
the, the question from the audience here. So the, the question around universities putting together the right programs, and, and the question's more centric around cybersecurity specialists, I want to broaden the scope a little bit because uh, and no, no offense to application developers, I, I love you if we have any of you in the, the room, but software engineers also have to be very, very focused on how they develop their applications up front, right? And I think in, in the mid-90s when the web was starting to uh, proliferate, we weren't necessarily engineering security into our uh, software applications. I still think that's prevalent today, not at the scale it was. But I really come back to the question, uh, and I'll, I'll go to Mr. Dell again since you're uh, you're native here within uh, the community. Are, are universities putting together the right kind of computer science programs and security programs to, to, to Sanjay's point, arm our companies, our organizations with the right skills to be successful in defending our, our networks in the future? It's an interesting one because I, I think they are putting the right courses together. The challenge we have as, as an organization is, is how attractive a graduate is when they graduate with that level and what level they expect to join the organisation at. Certainly at, at a technician level, if we think of operational infrastructure, we, we, we have no trouble attracting resources, building our own there. The types of graduates we're seeing coming out of universities are sort of coming in expecting to do a consultancy type role, a liaison, a planning role. Um, and whilst they've got the theory, uh, they, they, they don't yet have the demonstrative experience and, and the battle scars that's quite as attractive as we would like. Often, though, some of, these, some of these graduates do come from a background where they've worked in technology beforehand, and that absolutely is a multiplier. But, but young graduates coming out is a bit of a challenge for us because they, they, they want to operate at a certain level, and we want to see a bit more before then. Right. Um, the only other lens that I've put on, on, on the, what we're seeing coming out, coming out of universities and schools is a real challenge for us, and it's demonstrated by us all sitting on here. We're, we're looking to attract, to attract a greater female workforce. Um, and, and we're trying to work hard with the universities to a to develop you know uh, security cultures, but also to encourage a greater participation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's very important. We're starting to run down a little bit with time. I I would ask if did we have any Twitter questions come in that we may want to bring out to the group. I think everybody was scared by the social media conversations we had this morning, so the Twitter <laughs> feed's been a little <laughs> quiet today. So. Uh, um, you know, one, one last thing I'll, I'll say is, as we look to wrap up and, and get everybody squared away for, uh, for our lunch and, and get ready for this afternoon's breakout sessions where we still have our, our key tracks that are going to focus on the three C's again, the consumerization, cloud, and cyber threat capabilities, is we, we learned a great deal uh, that, that the threat is real, it's changing, it's evolving, and quite honestly, uh, the odds at this point in time aren't really good for the defense. <laughs> so, you know, in some, in some aspects, depending on who you talk to in the industry, uh, it could be a thousand to one offense versus defense in the capabilities. And, and cloud is driving those economies to scale uh, basically for the criminals as much as it's driving for us too. So we've got to be thinking a little bit differently there. But, um, you know, one of the, the key takeaways that uh, I think I had from this morning's session was there has to be a general awareness, uh, even from the younger generation that's a digital native that consumes a lot of IT, but doesn't necessarily understand what it means in the background or how to use it. And I think that goes through all generations. So I think there's a general security awareness of, you could be compromised on your PC because you're not running standard patch procedures, standard antivirus capabilities, and your device most likely is used in some form of an attack as a drone or a bot and used against some other critical infrastructure piece in an attack, okay? Those are things that you don't think about as a citizen that you're actually potentially by not doing due diligence within your own environment at home and certainly within your business network of the right things to do, you could be contributing potentially to national security issues. And I think that's a, that's a, a theme that is, is very harsh to talk about, but that's what's happening. They're acquiring these assets because people aren't doing the right things, they're not aware, they think they're invulnerable, and they're being compromised and used in, in attacks against national security and critical infrastructure. We've gotta become more aware and, and ultimately react towards that. So I think we're gonna wrap, we're right at the time here. I, I thank everybody for the attention this morning. Please stick around for the afternoon sessions. They're gonna be equally as good and uh, enjoy your lunch, thank you.